on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. We ended up with parts and pieces laying in the back of our shop. We need to make $100,000 out of nothing and let's do it. And, and we did it yeah. and we, we sold it, all of it within 12 months. And we've done that a few times and we've been very, very blessed with that. But yeah, the hustle, the hustle of the game. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high-performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? Chaz Wolf. I'm your host, Gathering the Kings podcast. Today, I've got Chris Graham here on the King stage. Chris, how are you, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Chaz. Well, I appreciate you being here, and I'm excited that we get to get into a new space. We've got entrepreneurs from across the country and across all different types of industries. And you're our first of, of this kind. And so since I clearly off, off air, I couldn't say this, this, uh, this word properly. <laughs> I'm going to let you say it. Chris, what kind of business do you have? I'm in the jewelry business. I have a retail jewelry store. A retail jewelry store. If you were looking to pronunciate that word, jewelry. Um, I, I so appreciate the retail space. Obviously, I've got a background there as well, but I want to know your story. But before we do, I want to know why you do this, man. Like, what's the, what's, what are you at it for? You're at it. You've been at it. You're doing it with excellence. You showed up today for the listeners that aren't watching. This dude looks sharp. He's got his coat on, looking fresh. Why? What's the purpose here? That's a, that's a big question. If we get into the purpose of why I'm in, why I'm in jewelry, how I got into jewelry, it's kind of a historical question. Okay. But why do I get up and keep doing what I do? That's a yeah. different question. Yeah. Uh, and the fear fear of failure is a big driver. You know, yeah. keep, keeps people keeps me motivated. You know, failure yeah. is right around could be right around the corner, and just striving to be the best that I can be in the industry that I'm in. Yeah, I like both of those answers. I think that they're both honest because I think even even high performers like you and I, who for all intents and purposes have achieved success, right? Like our businesses are, you know, uh, the size of less than 10%. People have businesses our size, right? So it's like, wow, we've, 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 we've gotten there. But for someone like you and I to think, man, I got to keep going so I don't fail. Like that's a pretty powerful motivator. It, is that, has that always been kind of in the back of the mind? Have you, is that close? Is that like a, like a healthy anxiousness that always keeps you driving? Like, give me a little bit more there. Yeah, I think it's a healthy anxiousness. You know, I never, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but getting into the history, I never intended to own my own business or be, you know, have a jewelry store. I didn't grow up in the jewelry business. This wasn't a uh, part of my upbringing. Sure. Uh, success came relatively easy to me early on. All the cards fell in my direction and then they didn't. And I went through some very hard times and I never want to go through them again. So <laughs> I work hard to, I guess, avoid that. I've worked yeah. hard to get, get, to get through those and to set my business up in, in a way to prevent crisis from happening again, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, I, we're going to get into this and I want you to share more of that because it's super powerful. I think that, I mean, it's our duty at some point to, to not be reckless, I guess. Although I would say even someone like myself, I'm an extremely aggressive business investor, you know, whatever name you want to dub it. So I'm always making risky moves. But I think that what you're saying really is I'm building something so that no matter what happens, I'm going to, I'm going to insulate, you know, myself from what has happened in the past. And I'm curious to hear what those stories bring to us here today. But do you think that, that the listener like, you know, just thinking about their perspective, if they haven't had those moments yet, like where, okay, so taking you back to where, you know, you had had some cards fall in your direction, and you hadn't experienced those, you know, kicks in the teeth, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you would have that motivation today or that that greater drive? Or is that like, is that because is that stemmed from that specifically? Yeah, it's a good question. I think some people are wired with drive, and uh, some people find drive, I think it's a healthy balance of both, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you were in sales before and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just 
you know, you know, show up, clock in, clock out. Obviously, you had to you had to earn your keep, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I like working. I like keeping busy, uh, and I like striving to be better at whatever I'm doing, you know, whether it be my personal life and my hobbies or at my work. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why buy the? I'm going to try to use your language. I'm going to I'm going to goof it, but why buy the? you know, the, the whatever clarity, the lower clarity when I can buy the best, right? Yeah, like, right, keep, right. Keep working towards the best. <laughs> yeah, be the best you can be. Absolutely. Okay, good stuff. Let's get into the story here. I want to know, since you never planned on being a business owner, how did it come to be? That's a, that's a, it is a good story. I'll, I'll take a minute here. So initially I wanted to be a nutritionist for a pro cycling team for pretty specific. Yeah. And turns out there, A, there's not many positions for that. It's difficult to get into. And I wasn't a great student. So I went to college to get my chemical engineering degree. Okay. And that didn't work out. A year and a half into, well, actually, quite honestly, I couldn't really get into a, I'll call it a, a real college. My grades weren't good enough. So I went uh, to a tech, technical college okay. for two years and to get good enough grades to be able to transfer into a, a state college. And well, it didn't happen either. So after a year and a half of a technical college, I dropped out and, uh, a friend of mine asked me, Chris, uh, what are you going to do now? And I said, I don't know. Yeah. And he said, uh, why don't you come work for me, me in my jewelry store? And I said, okay. I don't want to think about jewelry, but uh, sounds good. And yeah. so I went to work for a friend of mine who managed a, a jewelry store in a small town where I grew up in called Hutchinson. And, uh, and I learned a lot. It was a great door opener. They made all of their own jewelry. So I learned how the manufacturing side wow. of the business, I learned the goldsmithing, how to set a diamond, how to size a ring, how to repair jewelry. I learned the back end of the business there and kind of fell in love with it. And then once I wow. found something that I fell in love with, then I was able to study it, grab a hold of it and pursue it. And then I went on to get yeah. my gemologist degree. And now I'm a certified gemologist appraiser. It's the highest level of education in this industry. I think there's 483 of us in North America something like that. But it took wow. me something to kind of a hands-on experience, find something that I loved to kind of be able to dig in, read, study, do the homework that was required and uh, and be, become the top of my industry. So, yeah. Yeah. And so looking back at your, your school portion of the, uh, this didn't work out. That was kind of your answer there a couple of times. Was that just because you just weren't in love with it? You didn't really care about it maybe. And, and so that I've, that changed when you found jewelry? Yeah, I don't know. Your education wasn't a big part of my upbringing. It was, I was right. taught to learn the skill. Sure. Be the best at your skill and your craft and, and you'll never be out of a job. Yeah. And that was kind of what I was taught. So. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that that's too far off from pretty good advice. I think that, uh, you know, having a skill set and then mastering that skill set. And then I think maybe the next layer, which is then what, what can you do with that skill set, which obviously you've turned it into into a business what go ahead what were you say well i was, I was going to expand on how i got into jewelry then so then well, into, i guess the start of the entrepreneurial story yeah. and how i became to own my own business yeah so i worked for a few other jewelry stores and they're typically small family businesses and my previous job i worked for another family business in town rf moeller and i worked for for seven years i made it i was made a good living there it was it was a good job i i was top sales, made more money working for them than I did in my own business for probably 16 years before I made more money working for myself than for somebody else. Right. Um, but it just got to a point, I kind of hit that glass ceiling at top sales where I wasn't going to grow anymore. It's right. kind of bumping head with the owner. And I'm like, okay, what's my next move? How do I, what do I do? And that's when there was another store in the Twin Cities where I'm from that was available for sale. Unfortunately, the owner had pancreatic cancer. So he was looking to, to sell. So it was an unfortunate circumstance, but it worked out. He needed to sell his business. I was looking to buy a business. And uh, it was a moment in time where banks were giving money to anybody for anything. <laughs> so, so in that 2006 era, never, never before, never now would a bank do this deal, but they did. And it worked out. And uh, so I was able to acquire an, exist, an existing jewelry store. And uh, I guess that's, how, that's the story of how I got into yeah. Uh, business ownership. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously purchasing a business versus starting a, a brand new one, obviously is a different road. It's a different challenge. Looking back, I've done both and uh, I just buy it, you know, all the, all the, even, even gathering the Kings, it's more so of a, like a, of a purpose business for me. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't wake up one day and think, well, I'll go buy a mastermind group. No, this was just like 
something that I wanted to do with my life type of a thing out of discipleship and caring for people. But man, I'll tell you what, building even, even the stores that I built from scratch, it's like, I think I'll just buy one, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's got its own challenges though. So I definitely want to get into that because I liken it even to back in my sales career, I took over a sales team, same time, another guy, we both got hired at the same time. He had to start a sales team. I had, I took over an existing sales team at this company and we experienced very different challenges um, as far as, you know, build, he had to build from scratch and I had to basically win over a current group of people in your case, clients, a team, you know, the whole deal. So I definitely want to get into that. Let's, let's go back to some of those early years, especially before you were seven figures. And I want to know of a good decision that you made that you can look back on and go, you know what? I'm glad I did that. You know, I, I read that in kind of the, the pregame notes, and uh, quite honestly, that's a hard one to answer because I made a lot of decisions, a lot of fast decisions. I, I lived by, and maybe one, well, I try to live less by that now, but any decision is better than no decision, even the wrong decision. Yeah. And so, right. you know, early on when I bought the business, I was running pretty fast and making a lot of wrong decisions. And sure. uh, I guess the right decision I made was really to, to like you said, just buy the business because looking at you know, getting into a different industry, buying a manuf playground equipment manufacturing business or starting a jewelry store from scratch versus buying an existing jewelry store. And I decided right. to, after someone gave me some good advice, stick to what you know. So I bought an existing business. It might have not have been the business of my dreams or the, the, the style, of, you know, doing business the way I would want to do business, but it was a business. And, uh, and so that was, uh, I guess that was the best decision I made is really just deciding to, to do it and whatever it takes to go forward with it. So. Yeah. And I think that we can all as entrepreneurs think back to that moment where we just, you know, jumped, you know, mm -hmm. that, that yeah. little, that little, that little feeling that we got of like, Oh geez, I don't know how I'm going to land this, but what would you say in that first, like one to three years tactically, you said you were running fast. What does that mean? What were you doing inside this existing business? that you call running fast? Changing the inventory. So the, the way I would describe the, the jewelry store that I bought, it was kind of a classic 1970s business that didn't put a lot of money into updating it and becoming modern. Sure. Didn't, didn't have a computer yeah. system. So I was wearing all of the hats. You know, I'm yeah, of course. Uh, CFO, working on the financials, marketing guy trying to figure out marketing. Never marketed before when I worked for somebody else, they did it. I got to figure out advertising, right. uh, accounts payable, paying the invoices, buying the inventory. I remember I was getting, I'd get a, a shipment of inventory and I'd pay like a packing slip or whatever. And I knew I owed him some money. So I'd send him a check and then I'd maybe get an invoice. And then I'd say, can I pay this? And I'd send him another check. Then I get a statement. I'm like, God, I think I paid this already. And I, I'd like send him two or three <laughs> checks and, and it was just a mess. I, did, I had no idea what I was doing. Figured it out, but, but also it was the, the inventory wasn't my style or what I wanted to be. And, but I didn't have any assets to buy new inventory. So right. it took all I had and then some to, to acquire the business. Then there was no more for really remodeling, inventory. making the store look like I wanted to or inventory. So right. at five 30, when the store closed, I would take off my suit, put on my jeans, a tool belt and do construction, remodel, make the store as much of Chris Graham as I, you know, changed the look and the feel of the aesthetics of the store. Yeah. Also the inventory. I was, I'd sit down and I would, it's the nice thing about the jewelry business versus maybe restaurants or clothing is, you know, our inventory is a, it's an asset where we can, anyway, I would sit down and I would lift the stones out of the old settings that I didn't like the style. I'd lift the stones out, melt the gold and remake the jewelry. So I basically remade the entire inventory. Uh, with what I have, wow. this is what I have, and let's make it, let's make it mine. So yeah. just trying to put all of those pieces together, I guess, you know, kind of. Yeah. I mean, what you just said is in, I'm mind blown because obviously I've just never been in this business where you can literally melt it down and change it. But I think it's the mindset more than anything. Of course, we've all been in that place where we've worn all the hats and, and that's probably where the listener is right now, a little overwhelmed, but you kind of just breezed through that super easy around like, well, I, I did this and then I did this. And then afterwards I did that and I did the construction and then I melt down the gold and, and it just seemed like, yeah, like that's what you were supposed to do. When did you make the transition to, you couldn't do it all? Right. Because I think what you just described, we all can go, yeah, I've been there. And, the, and then the weight or the like frustration that comes with that. But the way you just shared it, it was like it just it was just part of the journey for you. And so was that unto a moment? Did you know that it was transitioning? Give us a little bit of backdrop there. 
Yeah, you know, and there is there is a book that that did help me through that process. It was called uh, "The Why Most Small Businesses Fail" and okay. what to, what to do about it. What was it the entrepreneurs? I forget the exact name of the book. The entrepreneurial theory. But yeah. It's why most small businesses fail and what to do about it. And sure, it talks yeah. about a pie baker and this guy who was really great at baking pies. And all yep. of her friends talk her, hey, you should go into, you should open up a pie shop selling your pies. So she does, so she opens up a pie shop selling your pies. But what she right. finds herself doing is showing up at 4.30 to bake the pies, but then setting up the store, cleaning, working with customers all day, at selling, and then at the night, doing the accounting, the bookkeeping, trying to figure out some advertising, cleaning up at the end of the day, and then figuring out how to bake pies back in the morning. The point of the story is she's, and I was now doing everything I did not know how to do right, right. and not doing what I was good at. I was good at selling jewelry. I knew jewelry, but that became the last thing I was actually doing in the day. Yeah. And once I kind of realized that, I'm like, wow, I need some help here. I need to figure out how to, a, how to do what I'm good at. If I'm going to be successful in, in the short term, I need right. to be selling jewelry. So I need to yeah. redelegate these other tasks that I don't know how to do. So I learned what I needed to learn, what I could learn, and um, and then hiring people around me and kind of creating the team around me to help with the other pieces of the puzzle that I couldn't do. Yeah, so I did kind of re. I thought because I was a great salesperson, I knew how to sell jewelry, right. that I could buy a jewelry store and do that really well. That's not exactly how it works. So yeah, I had to I had to figure that out early on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the book's called E Myth, and that's and- the. Thank you. A phenomenal book. We'll put it in the in the show notes. Yeah. The the reality here that you've mentioned, you actually mentioned two things, whether you've realized it or not. I want to point it out for the listener. Number one is that yes, there is this, there's this myth around what role that you have. And when you when you step into the business owner role, there's a whole lot more going on than just when you were in the sales role or just when you were in the craftsman role or whatever you had before. And so there's another level that you have to go to in order to think like that, which usually means you have to delegate and find the right people and all of these things. We talk about team building, leadership. It's a it's a big category of information that you were probably both still mastering to be if we're if we're being honest. The second piece that you talked about is that you happen to be the one that was good at sales. In order to grow a business, you have to be good at sales, marketing, and then sales. And so it just happened to be, that was the seat or the hat that you needed to wear. And so you personally, in this situation, needed to figure out how to delegate the other things so that you could focus on the sales. If the listener right now is listening, going, well, I'm not good at sales. Well, first off, I would suggest that they do some sales training themselves so that they they, they can understand it at least. But just like Chris delegated out the accounting and the, you know, bookkeeping or the, the advertising, what are all those other things? then you too need to hire out the sales because you can't just not do it. You have to have sales and marketing in order to grow to seven figures or multiple seven figures or eight or whatever. So you want to add anything to that? Yeah, the the piece I learned in that. So then after I kind of sorted all the early on of of, uh, business ownership, kind of sorted some of that out. And when I, to put in perspective, when I bought the business, I think it was doing previous to me 650,000 on its best years. And me personally, as a salesperson working for somebody else, I was selling about a million dollars of jewelry myself. So then when I took over the business, changed the inventory, and I became sales, I was selling, again, a million dollars myself. Now for my own business, which was great, but it creates a bottleneck in the system. The business can't grow. If I'm top sales and all the customers coming in are asking to work with Chris Graham, that's a bottleneck in the company. We can't grow past Chris Graham. So I had to learn to kind of remove myself from that, that seat. I needed it early on. It had yep. to, Yep. but there came a point I needed to transition that where I can't handle all of the sales or it, the business ends with me. And yeah. so then I started to turn it over to some of my other salespeople, you have transition clients, you know, train the staff, but also give them the faith and the trust that they can take care of, you know, my best clients, all of the clients. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and so then that was a process and it's still a process turning over now, turning over, you know, having a management team and delegating and training the staff and yeah. re- being the owner, but really removing myself from the spotlight to let the company grow beyond me. A hundred percent. The mindset is, is spot on. How, how did in those moments you said, you know, transitioning the client, because most likely the listener right now is in that same place where either been the sales or they've been wearing all the hats out of necessity, like we talked about. And so how does that person 
or how did you go about tr transitioning? Well, I want to work with Chris Graham to, well, here's my, here's a great guy on my team and I need you to work with him and not me. How did you, how did you do that with clients? Yeah, well, I, I try to do it without having that exact conversation, uh, but yes, really through follow-up. And I guess I would start off with, I started where I would be the front man, the face person with the customer, but the, if any research or back work, you know, if we're building up piece of jewelry for a customer, there was a staff person, a salesperson who was kind of, they would do all the behind the scenes work. And yep. then through that, the customer would have a little bit of contact with them and kind of slowly yep. introducing them to the customer. And that, that did work out really well. But then I also did have to kind of come to a realization where no employee is going to be 100% of me. No one's going to think the way I think, do it, right. work the way I work. So at what percentage of me am I okay with them being? You know, yeah. if they do 60% of the job I would do, is that okay? If they do, is it 80%? Is that my expectation? What percentage of that am I okay with? And that was some of this kind of helped me with that also. They're, they're not, no one's going to be 100% of Chris Graham. Yeah. So what am I okay with? What, what isn't okay and what is okay? And what do I have to accept and what do they have to be? Yeah, exactly. You're right. Because it, <laughs> it's this never ending cycle of, of trying to get someone to be you. That doesn't end well. There isn't, they're not going to be you. You aren't out there that you're going to find. And so the reality is, is that you have to be okay with it to a degree. But I loved how you I, I loved how you gave the 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 percentage because what that does for me in my mind is that if I can identify this percentage, let's call it 80%. What that does for me is that it allows me to be them without necessarily lowering the standard. We don't have to lower the standard of Chris Graham or Graham Jewelers. We just I just allow you to be you inside of the standard of what this looks like. And although it doesn't look exactly like me, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's only 80% of what a hundred looks like. It just means that you're you, I'm me. We're both operating inside of these guidelines of, of standard of, of, uh, you know, customer care or client experience, whatever we want to call it. And from what I have found, maybe you can speak to this from your team, but the autonomy that you give to your people when you do that, freeze them to be able to then start making decisions, treating customers without needing you. Would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And also finding out that then also your staff actually has skill sets that you don't have. And that's, that's when <laughs> you've been fun. suppressing the whole time because they're right, not right, like absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And then it gets fun because you can see what other people bring to the table that you didn't see before. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. good. Yeah, it, it, it really is the owner being open-minded, right? And not being a stubborn bull who, who wants it done the same way, the same time, you know, the same day. So I just appreciate that perspective. Let's, let's flip the coin here. You said you were a lot of things that you did wrong. Give us an example of one of those things that just didn't turn out the way that you had hoped. So I think, yeah, there's, that we, could, we could spend hours on this conversation, but I think the biggest decision that I made that I wasn't prepared for um, was to move the store and do a big expensive build out and be the, the big fancy jewelry store that I wanted to be and what I expected to be and kind of what I came from. Right. And right. Uh, like I said, this jewelry store I bought was, you know, built in the 1970s and the owner didn't put a lot of money into it. It, it wasn't modern. And I yeah. wanted a big fancy modern jewelry store. Right. And when I bought the business, sales just went north. They, sales went great year after year. I could do no wrong. But it was a the economy at that time. Also, this is I think I bought the business in 2003. The economy was great. You know, people were spending money like water, and yeah. it made me feel like I was a great businessman. <laughs> I was just <laughs> kind of in the right place at the right time. That's right. And so an opportunity came up for me to move locations, and I moved literally across the street, 795 East Lake Street, why is that at 800 East Lake Street, why is that? And um, I am in a peer group of other jewelers, kind of a round table, and which has been great for me. And they advised me to slow down, you know, maybe wait, you know, a little bit, get your financial legs underneath you a little bit deeper. Uh, uh, and I see, I saw the opportunity and I, I just closed my eyes and ran for it. Uh -huh. And I didn't really have the financial resources to do it, but through loans and funding, I, I could could make it work, vendor relationships with product. Anyway, I didn't have the proper inventory, meaning at the time, my customer base was buying expensive fashion jewelry. Let's say for female self-purchase, a $4,000 piece of jewelry to match a dress for the, for the event that evening. Business was great. And 
but I didn't, so I didn't have to have the core basics, like the, the, the milk of the grocery store, right? For us, it's right. a, a bridal business where the economy is good or bad. The young guy is going to buy an engagement ring, gold hoop, gold hoop earrings. They might not be expensive, but every woman has them. Yep. And the, the basics and the bread and butter of the business, I didn't have because I maybe didn't feel I needed it because um, I was doing good enough with the other inventory. Right. Uh, so I did a three quarter of a million dollar build out borrowed the money from the bank and moved across the street. And it was the same month Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers filed bankruptcy and the economy Ooh. went in the tanker. And I just increased my expenses. And I didn't have the basic inventory that really you should have. Right. And uh, so I got stuck. I got stuck hard. Yeah. And looking back, I would never ask to go through something like that, but I'm glad I did. Yeah. Without that, I would be doing the volume I am now and still not making any profit. Right. I learned how to be profitable and how to be a little bit smarter and build more secure legs of the business. So for us, for me, the bridal, I didn't have a bridal business. So I built, worked hard to build a bridal business. The repair and custom side of the business, where the, <clears throat> when the economy it goes down, people start to fix, instead of buying new jewelry, let's fix our old jewelry. Instead of buying a new piece of jewelry, let's remake an old piece of jewelry. And then also the estate piece of the business. So I, I kind of worked hard to build three legs of the business, the bridal business, the repair and custom business, and the estate and antique business. Because whether the economy is good or bad, actually when it's good, people buy new product. So I have the sales floor and all the new product for that. When and if the economy goes south, people stop buying new product or less but they start repairing their old product and they start selling their old gold and remaking their old jewelry. And so having those three legs to make us more recession proof became a mission of mine to become more recession resilient. And we, we set a goal a couple of years ago to do a million dollars out of just our repair and custom business. So if everything else went away, would we still be profitable in just repairs? Right. And the same thing with the estate and antique. If everything else went away, could we still be profitable in just that section of the business? Yeah. And so having different sections of the business that will be profitable and not dependent on the other. And that's kind of become yeah, it's huge. Important. Yeah, 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 a lot of it important. We could probably do the whole podcast on just how you did that and, and the detail of all that. But for for the purposes of here, I heard you say you over leveraged, you got a little, got a little ego, got a little excited. A little youthful in your decisions. I think that I could I could probably tell a story that matches yours in my youth of, you know, running before before the cart and horse, if you will. But sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and and it doesn't work out. The rea- what the immediately that I thought of though before you explained how you did it, I thought, well, he's still here. You made it. You survived, and so I wanted that to be like a point of like, man, even in that what was a terrible decision that someone else, probably multiple people in your group were like, don't do it. You did it anyway. And, and the resilience of, okay, now I'm in the moment. I either quit and roll over or, or I persevere. I press through. And uh, obviously you had a choice to do that. So I just wanted to kind of point that out for the listener that just because we, I mean, we're going to make mistakes since then you've made some mistakes since then I've made some pretty big mistakes, probably bigger financially than that one even they just don't hit us as hard now but the resilience that you learn from that and then specifically the strategy that you developed there becoming more recession proof obviously the nature of the market right now at, you know we're october of 2022 is very much like uncertain what what are we getting into are we at the beginning of a of a depression what's 2023 going to bring what's the housing market doing all these things that you're probably watching pretty closely for your business and so i love how you can take practical action inside of your business and go okay what does my client buy? Whatever it is, it could be they're updating their home now instead of buying a new home or instead of whatever, right? The same principles that Chris just gave you, I think apply in almost every single business. And and whether it's a pivot that you need to make or it's a service that you need to add, or if it's just a focus over a short period of time, I think that these are the things that make us recession-proof, resilient, whatever you want to call it. Would you like to add anything to this, Chris? Yeah, no, I just... Every, every business has areas of where they can refine and simplify and streamline and be, become more profitable. And that's what we had to look at in those times. Where do, we, where do we make our money? We need to do more of that and less of the other things. Where are the expenses we can cut? Let's cut them hard. I remember just 
exporting my expense sheet to an Excel and kind of break going through with a fine tooth comb, starting with the budget, what what can we afford? And backing out and making cuts, whether you just had to make, we just had to make cuts, whether we yep. felt we, we needed to. When, when you see the numbers and you lay them out, it was much easier than, you know, the entrepreneurial side of me. So, well, we need this and we need that if we're going to. Right. No, well, if you can't afford it, you don't need it. You figure it out. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah there's there's, just, there's just moments where you got to get, get creative, right? Being very creative. And now I have a lighted sign in my office, Hustle. I guess I became known as, uh, you know, for hustle, you know, just yeah. ma making money out of something. I, I mean, making yeah. money from nothing. And we, in our shop, we, you know, we're fortunate. We have our own shop. We make some of our own jewelry. We repair our own jewelry. So and we have parts and pieces. When we buy a state jewelry over the counter, sometimes it will, there's a nice stone in it. We'll lift the stone out. We'll put the setting aside. Maybe we'll melt it. We end up with parts and pieces laying in the back of our shop. It's like a, it's, it's gold and diamonds, but it's like a, a mechanic shop with nuts and bolts in, in the back of your shop. And we went yeah. through and like, okay, how do we, we need a hundred thousand retail out of nothing. How, how do let's make right. something. We need to make a hundred thousand dollars out of nothing and let's do it. And, and we did it yeah. and we, we sold it all of it within 12 months and we've done that a few times and we've been very, very blessed with that. But yeah, the hustle, the hustle of the game. Yeah. Yeah. The principle of taking inventory. What do we have? What do we have to sell today? It's like, you know, in, in my franchises, we work with produce, you know? And so it's like, okay, if we, or if we over ordered pineapple, guess what's on special, you know, it, right. it's pineapple pops, right. Or, or chocolate covered pineapple. It doesn't work like that necessarily in a franchise all the time because we were pretty systemized. We don't over order pineapple very often, but the reality is still the same. You take inventory. What can we do with what we have today to make something out of nothing? Basically. Yep. Yep. Love the principle. Okay, so let's transition here to the speed round in your business, in this jewelry business. What would be the one trackable metric? If you could only pick one thing to track forever and ever, what would it be? Expenses. Okay. And so, and why is that your one trackable? Because it doesn't matter how big or small the sales are. If your expenses are too high for what the sales are, that's a problem. So just always making sure the expenses match. Got it. So it's not so much necessarily matching them. Got it. Okay. Making sure you're profitable. Making sure the margin's there. Right. All right. Love it. Okay. I mean, that's maybe that's um, not you've a already give... KPI metric, but yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think that's more important than watching sales, top line sales. Yeah. We've had people say happiness. <laughs> so, sure. you know, like it's, it's whatever. I mean, I think, I think that it, it inside of the way that your brain works and functions, that answer allows us to see just a glimpse, you know? And so, and that's, that's the clarification I got from that is like, it's not so much necessary because you can only manage the expenses. You know, you go through the list and you remove what you can, and then that's it. Like there's not a whole lot of additional growth that comes out of that. But the, the comparison that you said there is, is where your margin is. If you're not making money, then it's tough right. to stay in business. Okay. You already mentioned the e-myth. Uh, any other sources of, of uh, books or resources that you would encourage business owners to check out for, for valid information? Yeah, you know, like I said earlier, I'm not a huge reader, but the two books I think that made an influence in my life early on were Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Great book. You know, good old school classic. And then Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Both yeah. of those were great. What to, I'm curious about Think and Grow Rich. It's something that I read every single year. What, what was your, like, why'd you put that on the list? Because uh, it's one of the books I remember reading and I've re I, I have read a lot of books. And I don't remember the titles of them or even the email. It was a great book, but I couldn't remember. Remember, but those good, I, yeah, those yeah. I remember. That's good. Good stuff. Great books. Obviously traditional. I can't, can't go without them. I got one last question here for you, Chris. Take you back a little bit. I want to know if you had a chance to whisper in the younger Chris's ear. What would you say? Hmm, listen to the advice people give you. Take it to heart. And yeah, listen, listen to other people more. Yeah. That's good. That's good. The listener here is listening to you today. You've given them quite a bit to think about from your story. So we appreciate that. You've been real and authentic the whole time. So just appreciate all of that. You've built something pretty special. How can the listener find you? Maybe they want to buy some jewelry from you, or maybe they want to just reach out and ask you about your story. How can they find you? You know, they can just email me at chrisagramjewelers.com. Of course, I read my emails all the time. Um, my phone number, I don't know if you can post my phone number on here. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here every day. So yeah. Perfect. Sounds good. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes. They can easily reach out of course with your website and all that fun stuff, but 
yeah, I'm sure you've got some some fun custom pieces that would be unique to have. Oh, yeah, happy, happy to help all those customers. Your uh, listeners coming from six figure businesses to seven million or seven figure businesses making some profit and trying to figure out what to do with it now. I mean, now is when you yeah. treat your spouse for putting up with you after all those long hard hours you've put in. See, right? there we go. <laughs> there we go. A hundred percent. Yeah. Because these guys and gals are, are pushing hard and, and you're right. I might have to get up with you on, on a move. I don't think my wife listens to the, I think I make so many podcasts that I don't think she'll listen, but I'm, we've got our 15 year anniversary coming up next year and I'm trying to make a, make a move. So I'll have to get with you on, on there you what go. we can do with that. Perfect. So, all right. We just appreciate you being here. Blessings on your family, your business, your staff, the whole deal. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Chess. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Gathering the Kings. We hope you got a ton of value today and learned a thing or two about taking your business to seven figures and beyond. If you desire more and want a community around you to help you get there, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. That's gatheringthekings.com. And I want you to apply for our next Becoming a King 90-Day Intensive. We are extremely exclusive by nature as a group. What that means is that we're really wanting only the entrepreneurs who take their business and targets super serious to apply. So if that's you, you think you got what it takes to level up your business, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com and apply. And we will see you on the other side.